Uh, so our next speaker uh, is Emily Pavlik, um, who grew up in Northwest Indiana and attended Earlham College, where she got a BA in biochemistry. Um, after graduating, she taught environmental education at a variety of nature centers and nonprofits across the country. Uh, and this is where her love for birds, and specifically raptors, grew. Um, currently, she is a master's student in the Integrated Biosciences Master's Program with the University of Minnesota Duluth. Uh, and she'll be talking today about the work she's doing um, at Hawk Ridge for her master's thesis. Emily. Jen, can you all hear me? Okay. Sorry, I'm a little short for this podium. So uh, you might not be able to see me, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, so yeah, my name is Emily, and today I'm going to be telling you kind of the story of my master's thesis um, at the University of Minnesota Duluth in collaboration with Hawk Ridge. So just to give you a little outline of a roadmap for today, just going to give you a brief intro to Hawk Ridge, some observations and questions from Hawk Ridge, then go into some of my objectives and hypotheses for this work, talk a little bit about my methods, and end today with um, some conclusions, but mostly some next steps of where this research will go. So the setting for my research is Hawk Ridge. So just to gauge a little bit, um, a show of hands, how many of you have spent a fall up at Hawk Ridge? Any amount of time. Awesome. So if anyone did not raise their hand today, I hope to see you up there next fall. Um, uh, but just to give you a brief reminder of what Hawk Ridge is, Hawk Ridge is located along the westernmost tip of Lake Superior in northern Minnesota. And it is an incredible place to witness visible fall migration. And it's incredible for a couple of different reasons. Um, actually, a myriad of different reasons, but the two main ones that I like to think of are the location of Lake Superior to the east and the presence of suitable boreal habitat to the north and the west. And so this acts as a bit of a funnel, funneling birds down through Hawk Ridge. And in the fall, we can see them, we can count them, we can band them, and we can learn a little bit about um, their life histories. Hawk Ridge is managed by Hawk Ridge Bird Observatory. And the counting and banding of um, raptors has occurred since 1972. So that's a pretty long um, data set that we have available to ask really interesting and unique questions and learn a lot about raptors as they pass through Duluth. So just to give you um, a few numbers in, oh, excuse me, there we go, give you a few numbers. In the fall, about 60,000 raptors are counted and about 3,000 raptors are banded um, each fall at Hawk Ridge. So like I said, this is an incredible long-term data set that we have available to look at trends in raptor populations um, and other interesting factors. But one of the questions that still remains um, unanswered that could really add to all of this information that we get is where are these raptors coming from? And so that is kind of the focus of my research um, for my master's thesis. And uh, I hope to add some information to this question. So the tricky thing with migratory animals is they move. Um, and so it can be really difficult uh, for us to study because they inhabit many different locations throughout their full annual cycle. And each of these locations is essential for um, their survival and for um, their population to um, keep going. So when we Think about a migratory species. We like to talk about migratory connectivity. So this is just the linking of individuals or populations between different stages of their full annual cycle. And this includes um, breeding uh, stages. This includes um, during migration, any stopovers that they use. And it also includes any non-breeding um, areas. And like I said, each of these is really important for understanding the survival of a population. We can think about migratory connectivity as being both a spatial and a temporal concept. So if we think about that, 
an organism that has high spatial connectivity has a strong connection between one location and another. So in this example, we have two different populations, the black and the white dot, and they're spending um, their time in different locations, and there's a strong connection between those two locations, and they stay separate. So that's an organism that has a, a high spatial connectivity. We can also think of connectivity as being temporal. So this is when populations move with a distinct timing. So their timing is very closely regulated, um, and they move in a, a pretty consistent manner. When we think about a species that has this high connectivity, one that has high connectivity can be kind of susceptible to disturbances within the environment. So for instance, if we have a spatial disturbance like habitat loss, a species that has spa high spatial connectivity is going to be more affected than one that has a little bit more flexibility in their movements. The same thing goes for high temporal connectivity. If an organism um, is dependent on a certain resource, so for instance, maybe a plant or um, an insect, and if the timing of that event or that phenology changes, then an organism that depends upon that is going to be more impacted than one that's a little bit more flexible. So we can see this mismatch if an organism has this high connectivity. So why do we care about migratory connectivity? Well, as I've just alluded, it's really essential for understanding an organism's ability to adapt to change, so such as climate change. It's also really important for understanding population dynamics, gene flow, and community structure. And all of these things are really important for management and conservation. So if we're noticing declines in a species um, during migration, we might ask what is happening and, and where is that happening? Is that related to where they're breeding or is it related to somewhere else during their for, full annual cycle? So that's why it's important to understand all that. And I probably don't need to elaborate much on this. You probably already know this, that we need to know something about all of these different locations. So how do we study migratory connectivity? Well, we can do this in a variety of different ways. And I like to lump them into two different categories, extrinsic techniques and intrinsic. So extrinsic techniques include things like mark recapture. So this is when we put a band on a bird. And this can be great. We can put bands on tons of birds. Um, like I said, we ban 3,000 birds or raptors each fall at Hawk Ridge. Um, but it also usually relies on us recapturing that bird. And that can be, be challenging. Another thing that we can do is use color bands and wing tags. These can be really useful because we don't have to rely on recapturing. We just have to rely on reciting an individual. And then the third major one is electronic tracking devices. So this, this is things like geolocators, satellite transmitters, MODIS tags. And these are really amazing because we can get really um, fine detail spatial resolution on where birds are spending their time. However, there are some downfalls. They can be pretty costly. And for some species, the technology is not quite there yet. Um, so for smaller birds, um, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming soon. <laughs> um, in terms of intrinsic techniques, these are things that are inherent to the bird. So these are things like genetics, trace elements that might be found in the feathers of birds. Um, so for instance, we uh, do a lot of mercury analysis up at Hawk Ridge, and that's a trace element that has a spatial gradient that we can utilize to understand a little bit about where a bird is coming from. And then we can finally use um, stable isotope analysis, which relies on the spatial distribution of different elements um, and different types uh, of isotopes throughout an ecosystem. Uh, so like I said, uh, all of these have pros and cons. And using them together and mixing and matching is the best way to get some sort of understanding of where these birds are spending their time. But today, I'm going to focus my time on talking with you about using mark recapture and stable isotope analysis to understand a little bit more about where the raptors we encountered during migration are spending their time during the breeding um, season. So that brings me to my two 
main objectives that I'm going to talk about today, which is to estimate natal origins. So where are the juvenile raptors that are banded at Hawk Ridge migrating from geographically? And then two, to determine the dispersal patterns. So are there patterns in migration timing in relation to the natal origins of these raptors? And to meet these two objectives, um, we're just going to look at two species today, the sharp-shinned hawk and the northern saw-wet owl. So these two species uh, were mainly selected because they are the most commonly banded and encountered raptors at Hawk Ridge. They also have very different life histories. We have a diurnal species and a nocturnal species. But one thing is very common or very similar about them, and that is that they are both extremely secretive during their breeding season, which is very unfortunate for us if we want to study them during their breeding season. So a great way that we could learn a little bit about their populations is during migration when they're more conspicuous. Um, and we can more easily study them. So this is where um, my research comes in to kind of try and add to where um, we have some lacking knowledge in the breeding season. So what do we know about kind of the distributions of these birds? Um, we know that they both spend or, or both inhabit um, area in much of North America up into the boreal forest. Um, we know that at different parts of the year, um, we can find these birds throughout Minnesota. Um, and we know that their breeding habitat tends to be in dense forests, usually coniferous or coniferous to deciduous um, habitats. What else do we know about them um, based on what we find at Hawk Ridge? Um, so something interesting about shark-shinned hawks is that we've actually been seeing kind of a, a declining trend in their populations at Hawk Ridge. So this uh, graph over here is the raptor population index for sharp chin hawks that are counted as they pass through Hawk Ridge. And you can see that there is this kind of trend of decline. Now, I will tell you this is not a statistically significant decline. So we can't necessarily say that these populations are decreasing at Hawk Ridge. But if we look at counting sites across North America, we will see that they are actually declining at many of the sites. Um, so this is a, maybe not an alarming cause for concern, but something to be aware of. What's going on here? Does it have to do um, with a certain location during their full annual cycle? The other thing that we know about sharp chin hawks at Hawk Ridge is that they tend to have elevated mercury levels in comparison to the other hawks that we capture. And the, the thought behind this is that sharp chin hawks are avian specialists. They eat mostly other birds. And so therefore, they're feeding at a higher trophic level and maybe more susceptible to toxins um, in the environment. So that's another thing to keep in mind, um, that you know, if we are seeing um, decreasing trends, what's causing this? Maybe we have some, um, some evidence to point one way or another. Um, and then finally, something that is a, a detriment to any species is that of habitat loss. So um, you've probably seen these Audubon climate reports before. Um, the northern saw-wet owl is one of the species that Audubon um, has featured. And they're expected to lose, if we keep at the trend that we're at right now, about 35% of their range um, within the next uh, 25 years. Worst case scenario that they have is by 2080, they would lose about 99% of their range. So these are all things to keep in mind when we're thinking about these, these birds and, and um, trying to decide you know, what areas of their range are, are affecting their, their survival and their populations. All right, so let's look at what band recovery data can tell us from Hawk Ridge. So these two maps are maps of recoveries. So when I refer to a recovery, I'm talking about any bird that was banded at Hawk Ridge and then encountered elsewhere, or even this map, these maps include birds that were banded somewhere else and then captured at Hawk Ridge, so foreign return. Um, so 
all of these dots represent a different um, encounter. And I mean, it looks pretty awesome. There's a lot of dots on these maps. We can start to see some really interesting patterns. So sharp-shinned hawks tend to stick pretty closely to this Miss Mississippi corridor. We've got one uh, that's been sighted all the way up into Alaska. So perhaps um, all of this area in here could be utilized by sharp-shinned hawks that migrate through Hawk Ridge. Uh, we also see that they extend all the way down into Mexico and down into Central America. So this gives us a lot of great information. Northern Sawit owls, you can tell, are very widely dispersed and all the way to Maine, all the way over to British Columbia. Um, this one actually represents the furthest east-west movement of a northern saw wet owl in the BBL records, which is really fascinating. Um, but let's take a look at, you know, in terms of the number that we banned at Hawk Ridge, what does this actually account for? So if we calculate the percent returns for both of these species, for sharp shinned hawks, this only represents about 0.76% of all birds that we banned. So that's less than 1% of all birds we get a return on, which doesn't seem great. If we look at northern sawwet owls, we see it's a little bit better. It's about 2.9% of all returns. And this is largely due to the extensive um, owl monitoring network that's in North America. Um, but remember, I'm mostly concerned with where these birds are coming from in the fall. So I want to know where are they coming from, probably north of us. So if we think about the percent of all of those band returns that are coming from north of Duluth. For sharp shinned hawks, that accounts for about 33%, and for sawwets, it's about 41%. Those numbers seem pretty awesome to me, but you might be, you know, kind of scratching your head. I know I was, and because there's not a lot up here, right? The, most of the distribution appears to be down to the south of us. So what is really going on here? And to, to understand that, we, what we really need to look at is the density of these returns. So each of these dots, if there's multiple birds at a dot, we can't see that from this map. So if we zoom in a little bit closer and look at the density of these returns, what we find is that actually the density is most concentrated north of us. So on these maps, the purplish blue is a low density up to the red, yellow, and um, kind of the whitish color is high density. And I've zoomed in on these maps on the areas where there is the most density. Um, so you can just kind of ignore all the parts that I've cut off. Just trust me, it's all bluish purple. So most of the density is right in these areas. So what is that? Well, this is Thunder Bay. This is Whitefish Point. So those are the two areas where there's a lot of banding activity going on. And so we're not actually getting that many returns to the north that are informative to us. Okay? We know that there, we have some birds coming to these areas, but what we want to know is kind of the spread and the distribution of where the birds are coming from. I wanted to take this just one step further because I thought it was really interesting. And so I decided to look at our northern sawwet owl recoveries, which is over here, the same map you've seen. Compared to all of the monitoring sites for northern sawwet owls in Project Owlnet, and if we look at those that are north of Duluth, I mean, if we look across the country too, but specifically north of Duluth, we start to see that this map that we've created here is essentially just a map of the banding station. So this is completely unnecessary, but you can watch this saw at owl visiting all those banding sites. <laughs> um, so what, what, is, what is my point here? Well, my point is that band recoveries are really informative for understanding kind of the broad range of where these um, species are going to, but it doesn't tell us the full picture, right? We're dependent on people to be in these places to learn if a bird has been there based on band returns. So how can we learn more? Well, we can learn more, hopefully, by using stable isotope analysis. So 
Um, what is a stable isotope? It's basically just a variation of an element that has a different number of neutrons in its nucleus. Um, you probably didn't know you're getting a chemistry lesson today, but chemistry has been my love since fifth grade, so here you go. Um, so we are going to be looking at hydrogen stable isotopes, which has um, naturally occurring. We have two um, variations of hydrogen. We have a light version, which is here, and a heavy version, which has a neutron in its, in its nucleus. And basic isotope theory is that light isotope, uh, isotopes can move and react more readily, and heavy isotopes move more slowly. So we can think about this like carrying a light box versus a heavy bag. The light box is going to require less energy, it's going to move quicker, react faster, whereas a heavy bag is going to require more energy to move in the ecosystem. So you can see this person is sweating, they're exerting a lot of energy, and that is essentially, in the most basic terms, how isotopes work. So as um, water, which, which contains hydrogen, moves through, through the environment, it gets deposited in different ratios, and that is what we measure. And so what we can get is a map like this, which each of these colors represents a different ratio of light to heavy isotopes. And we can see um, these, these gradients within the environment. And this is called an isoscape, or an isotopic landscape. And it's just showing the variation of stable isotopes within the environment. So how does this relate to bird migration? Well, if we know those ratios within the environment, we can relate that back to birds. So let's say we have a bird who is up here breeding in this part of North America, and they're drinking water, they're consuming prey, and all of that has an isotope content that is specific to that environment. So when they molt their feathers and grow new feathers, those feathers are going to contain isotope signatures that are reflective of their environment. Because feathers are inert and don't change, they're going to retain that same signature when they move from one place to another. So during migration or on their um, non-breeding grounds, we can take a feather, analyze it for stable isotopes, and relate it back to where they came from. So in the fall of 2020, I collected data from um, close to 900 raptors migrating through the loop. Um, I uh, took feather clippings from saw wet owls and collected contour feathers from um, sharp chin hawks, and these have been processed and sent to a lab for analysis. So after we get the data back, you know, kind of what, what does this look like? Well, we need to start with a base map, and that base map is a precipitation isoscape. So this is um, an isoscape that's based on data from around the world, there's many different monitoring stations um, across the world that monitor precipitation ice, um, isotopes. So we make a precipitation isoscape, but then we need to calibrate that to what a feather would um, show as the same signature. And so what we need is known origin samples. And lucky for me, there's been a big movement recently to create a database of standardized um, known origin samples. So each of these known origin samples, we know the location, and so we can take a feather sample and kind of calibrate that to the environment. Um, I'd also like to just thank, um, I was able to get some specimens from museums, um, and one of those being the Bell Museum. They provided some feather samples with known origin um, that I'm also analyzing alongside my unknown data. And so then what we do is we take these two things and we create a regression equation between them. So in this uh, graph, this is the precipitation isoscape, and this is our, our known feather data. And we create this line that relates the environment to our organism. And then we can use that to create a tissue isoscape. So this gives us the values that we would expect to see um, at each of these locations. And then if we want to assign an area of origin 
to a specific bird. We can use Bayesian statistics to create a probability surface of where that bird is most likely to be. So on this map, the um, bright yellow colors are the most likely places that this hypothetical organism would live. Which you might be thinking, wow, this does not look great. <laughs> that is a really large area um, that that organism could come from. And that's where we come to constraining this assignment. So there's many different ways that we're gonna approach this. And one is using our breeding range and abundance. So if we combine these two together and eliminate any area where we know that that organism wouldn't inhabit, we can constrain that knowledge to a smaller area. We can also use our banding return data to help us do this. So for my second objective of migration patterns, the first thing and most simple thing that we're planning to do is to take our isotope values and take um, our banding date and just plot a simple regression. And what this will allow us to do is to see whether the birds banded early in the season are coming from further south or further north or vice versa. So this is one option that they're coming from uh, the south first, option two that they're coming from the north, and option three that there's absolutely no pattern whatsoever. <laughs> I hope for not that one. Well, except maybe for sawwets, they are very uh, nomadic. Um, so our main hypothesis for this, especially for sharpshin hawks, is that stable isotope analysis will indicate that early season migrants within the same sex and the same species will originate from further south than late season migrants. We're also hoping to look at other patterns within this, but this is the main um, pattern that I was going to talk about today. So um, with that, I will go into some of my conclusions and next steps. Uh, so the first conclusion is that band recovery data is limited, especially to the north. And so this suggests to us that we need different techniques in order to fully understand where these birds are breeding before coming through the loop. Um, we hope that stable isotope analysis will give us more information about where raptors are migrating from, but it ultimately will probably not completely answer the question. Our next step is to um, actually analyze the stable isotope data. Unfortunately, I've had some setbacks due to COVID, um, but this week, probably right at this moment, they are analyzing my samples. And um, so in the coming months, I'm, uh, hopefully we'll get my data back and we'll be able to move into the analysis phase of things. Um, That analysis will include both the dispersal patterns and figuring out natal, or, natal origins and working out how to constrain that knowledge with our breeding range and our banding data. So today I'll just leave you with some broader impacts. So the ultimate goal of this project is can we infer spatial patterns in Hawk Ridge's long-term data set? One area that is our environmental contaminant data. The hope was that we could use the stable isotope data along with environment, environmental contaminant data to pinpoint where populations might be most impacted by these environmental contaminants. The second area that we're really interested in is phenotype variations. So how do size plumage, and plumage um, vary across the landscape? And how can we learn about that to improve our knowledge of when a bird comes through Hawk Ridge, where is it coming from? And ultimately, all of this um, will hopefully help to better conserve and um, lead to um, more land management that can help to, to conserve these populations into the future. So with that, I'd just like to thank um, some people. First of all, my advisor, Matt Ederson, Special thanks to the banding director at Hawk Ridge, Frank Nicoletti, all of the people at Hawk Ridge, staff and volunteers. Um, none of this is possible <laughs> without you. Um, the Integrated Biosciences Program at UMD, and then, of course, all of my funders, and a special thank you to MOU through the Savaloha grant, um, who's helping me to 
analyze most of my sample. So, so appreciative of all of that support. Um, so with that, I will take any questions. Excellent. Are there any questions? If you just raise your hand, I think Dick can find you and, and we'll get a mic to you if you have questions for Emily. I was just wondering if the isoscape is assumed to be constant through time and what might influence changes in that? That is a really awesome question. Um, it does, um, so precipitation does fluctuate with time. You know, we all know that. Um, and so for these models, um, it's been found that if you use a long-term average, that's a lot um, more informative than using, say, um, a, a, a short um, time frame. Um, and so, yeah, I think there is potentially some concern that with changing climate um, and different amounts of energy within our system that maybe some of these assumptions that we're making um, might become more challenging and, and interpretation might become more challenging. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, an average of all of the, the isotope ratios over a long period of time seems to be what gives the best estimation. If the okay, if the um, you have to look at when those feathers were grown, yeah, and when they were mo or yeah, okay, yeah. So yeah, that's a great question. So this relies on the fact that we know a lot about the the molt timing of these individuals. So depending on you know what time you you uh, collect a feather, you're going to learn something different, right? Um, but we know that these birds reliably are molting their feathers on their breeding grounds, and so we can pretty confidently say that they were grown during that time and are reflective of that, that breeding season. Um, there's, you know, in some materials, uh, so isotopes are often used in kind of forensic work, um, and so for things like um, a, a human hair, we could collect a human hair, and it's kind of a time series of where we as a human have lived over you know, the growth of that whole entire hair. So you can, within certain um, tissues, like for instance, uh, talons, you can get kind of a time series of, of different locations that that organism may have inhabited, which is pretty cool. Are there any problems with um, uh, noise created by human um, production of isotopes, like for example, a large power plant mm -hmm. uh, spilling out uh, uh, pollution from uh, minerals that are taken in a completely different area, uh, muddying up the situation. Um, that's a great question. Honestly, not that I know of, but there are certain regions of you know, the world that definitely have more error associated with them, um, just due to, you know, the climatic events that occur there. Um, but as far as I know, not something like a, you know, a power plant that's releasing things. That's a really good, good question. When you make the uh, base maps, um, do you have to make one for each individual species, avian species, or will all of the different species show the same uh, isotope ratios from a given spot? Yeah, so for raptors, it, it appears that um, they're relatively similar. Um, but if you were to look at very dis, d um, different um, species, you would want to make a specific base map. And so that, that's kind of another limitation is that, and, and a, a great reason why having museum specimens um, is, a, is a wonderful thing is that you don't have to go out and survey all of those areas. You, we have this kind of resource already set for us of, of 
specimens from known locations that can be used. Excellent. Thanks for your questions, and thanks, Emily.